Ramai, Rakatira. Welcome to the Rakatai Pinoa. This is uh, now a fourth time <laughs> I've managed to candidate to be for NK, and I've been cheering NK for 12 years. So, first of all, I want to today to apologize for our chief executive, Yvonne Carly, not being here. She is unwell, but she is not totally incapacitated, so she just feels incredibly embarrassed. This is the first meeting of ANCAP that she's ever had to miss. So, hopefully, we'll uh, probably enroll to her in the next I'd like to uh, welcome. Um, Two distinguished guests we have, two ministers of the Crown, and two candidates. Uh, Calvin Davis, the candidate for uh, Tito Bara, and um, Carmel Cipollini, who is standing for the constituency, both uh, ministers in the present government. Um, we have uh, one community board member here, I think, Trish, there you go, over there. I haven't seen anyone else. Is that right? No, that's great. That's good. So, okay. So, uh, first of all, um, the escape route is via the stairs or jumping off the balcony. <laughs> uh, that's about all. The, the, the bathrooms are in the corridor on the other side of these rooms. So, access is either through the glass doors uh, of the vestibule or through the kitchen, one way or the other. Um, Second important thing is some people have felt left out uh, about not getting a seat here today. It was popular. We are uh, tenants of the council here. We're obliged for today to respect the level two restrictions in Auckland. And so that's why we are roughly two metres apart. And although the capacity, you could take 100 people and come from two metres apart. So if anyone feels uh, aggrieved about that, um, I'm sorry, but that's just what we had to do to organize it. And we gave plenty of warning to people who needed to be here uh, to, uh, to make sure they were, they were forked in, and they have, uh, and that's been greatly appreciated. So the format today is, <clears throat> we have the candidates here for the North Shore seat and the candidates for the North Coast seat. These are the two uh, Rohi in this part of the North Shore that ANCAD mainly focuses its time on. And we have over 160 organisations as members of ANCAD for whom we provide governance, skills, help, assistance with fundraising and funding applications, a whole range of matters. So we won't go into now, talk too much time. So our role here is, has been over the past 12 years that Yvonne and I have been involved is to use these occasions, central government and local government elections, to bring our community groups together to ask questions that worry them or are of concern to them about community development issues. So today we have um, seven sets of questions um, and some of the topics have got two questions attached to them. We're going to deal with the topics together and the organisations who have asked for put forward the question will introduce the question and uh, if those organisations are not here today, I'll read out the question at that time. So the format's going to be pretty simple. We start with an introduction from the candidates. Uh, we'll go through starting with the North Shore seat um, alphabetical order by surname to start with. They've got three minutes each. Jeff at the back, um, a very accomplished accountant, will be keeping time and he is incredibly accurate. So there is uh, a card for two minutes, a bell for two minutes, a red card for three minutes. When we come to the questions, it's a quick one minute response each. <coughs> And there's a red card at the end of your one minute. <coughs> the other important thing today is because we've got about anywhere from 40 to 60 people on Zoom sitting somewhere in the ether, and we're, we're on here. So the camera is focused on the rostrum as each candidate speaks. 
to introduce themselves and then to answer their questions, they'll be being broadcast live out there. So just be conscious of that, and that means, of course, all noise in this room will be picked up on Zoom, so if we can keep the noise levels down a bit, that would be great. Um, I think apart from that, I was uh, just going to take this opportunity uh, to ask Kelvin whether he could just give us a karakia to open this uh, this meeting today, and um, I think we'd all appreciate that. Kia Kia <laughs> So, are we ready? <laughs> Candidates. Our first candidate is Mike Brewer. The New Conservatives. Thank you. And uh, I'm standing uh, for the North Shore, and Bill, uh, my colleague here, is standing for North Coast. Um, firstly, thank you for your time today and to come out and show us that you care about democracy and uh, care about freedom. Um, I've actually still got the smell of turpentine on my hands from uh, wiping off some signboards this morning uh, with the word racist on them, which some might agree with, with and some might not. Um, I'm actually here because 90% uh, of people may not agree with the new conservative policies, but we only need 5% to get into government. So I'm talking to probably 5 or 10% of people here uh, statistically. Uh, what I would like to tell you is a little story. I'm not actually from the North Shore. I'm from a little town around the coast of Taranaki called Okanaki. And when I was 12 years old, I had a teacher who came out from Rhodesia. And I was friendly with a lot of the local Maori kids in my hometown in, in this particular class. And this guy was a racist. He didn't like the Maori kids because they were harder to teach and they were a bit more smart, gave him a bit of lip. And he sent them all out of the room, including me, because I was quite tanned in those days, even though I'm not of Maori extraction. He thought I was just one of the bunch. So I spent this part of the term outside of the class, uh, uh, at the, you know, being on the receiving end of a bit of racism. So I think it's highly ironic now I'm standing for the new conservatives, which are all about equality, free speech, uh, and freedom of ideas. And I get labeled because Actually, labelling people is a, is a cheap way of trying to shut them down and to, to dismiss them and delegitimise what they have to say. And it also displays an aspect of fear that they might be saying something that A, is true, or that, they, that you really, really don't agree with and you want to shut down because you don't agree with it. So that's our, our I guess, one of our main platforms from the New Conservatives perspective is we believe in democracy. We believe in free speech, and one of our core policies is to bring in citizens-initiated binding referendums so that between elections, on social issues in particular, the people get a say. So we want to give that say back to you guys, us as the voters. So I'm Mike Brewer, I'm standing for the New Conservatives in the North Shore. Um, your party vote is probably best here with Simon, my colleague on the left. I'd have more chance of becoming the uh, candidate for the North Shore as finding a uh, leprechaun on East Coast Road. So I'm just after your party vote, folks. And I only need 5% of you to, to give us your party vote, and we are in with an influence. So an influence is all we need. So thank you for your time. And my name's Mike Brewer. Give us your party vote for the New Conservatives. Thank you. Nick Jura, Nick Kearney, um, probably well known for a lot of North Shore people, uh, Sam Bang, oh, goodness, probably not so well known for some of you, but uh, on that note, yes, I have been on the North Shore for 40, 42 of my 51 years, I'm a proud North Shore person, educated at uh, Milford Primary, Tackerton and all the Westlake boys, uh, I'm a Westlake boys old boy, I'm their charitable trust, a trustee of the charitable trust for the old boys, I'll talk about that a bit later in terms of community involvement, I have a business here on the North Shore, a law firm, of which I'm a partner of, and I also have another business, 
it operates out of Balcony that I'm involved in as well. I live in North Coast, I'm slightly out of area, but uh, of course we're just seeking, I'm just here seeking the party vote for the Act Party today, not your personal candidate vote. I um, was not meant to be standing at this election. I've stood in the last six elections, or since 2005, uh, five elections. I was meant to take a break at the time, but the North Shore candidate um, fell ill and, and had to pull out. So I answered the SOS and, and here I am uh, once again. So I'm here just to say, look, um, I'm a, a local person, um, you know, um, I love the North Shore uh, and I also, you know, emphatically actually really, uh, really love what the Act Party stands for. And I think what the Act Party stands for represents what most North Shore people stand for as well. I'm here to, today just to say, if you're considering uh, voting for me, please don't. I think a vote for me is a complete waste of vote. Uh, I, would, I would personally like a uh, party vote for the Act Party if you were inclined to, uh, to vote for Act or like what I'm saying. Um, the other part of the question was, what are the three issues that we see facing the North Shore and perhaps the North Coast area? I think the North Shore, um, as an electorate, fundamentally need, needs a second harbour crossing. It's been promised for a long time. It's holding back a lot of things. It's holding back transport. It's holding back the economy. Uh, it needs it badly. That's the first thing that has to happen in it been talked about for a long time and I think we need to do it. Uh, the second thing I think um, North Shore and North Coast need is we need the economy to start rebuilding from this COVID, obviously this COVID disruption or the COVID lockdown that, that we've encountered. Uh, and obviously uh, I think all parties are focused, uh, focused on that. We can't simply borrow more money and hope to fund our budget deficits by printing money uh, in Wellington. So we have to address the economy and, and, and a growing economy means more jobs and lifting more people out of poverty. That's the second thing. I think the third thing on a personal level is I would actually, well, actually let's talk about housing. I know housing comes up a bit later, I'll address that later. On a personal level, I live in North Coast. I would, I would like to see the sky path built. Um, I know it's a controversial topic for some people living in North Coast and North Coast Point. Uh, I think if that can get done, um, you know, we'll see a whole lot more transport choice available for, for North Shore residents. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. The uh, next speaker from the North Shore will be uh, Shai Nibbler for the top party. Can, can I just, um, just remind you about one thing? We had got these, these talks and can just see if you can just tell us the three things that are on your mind that have a community base and what you might deal with, how you might deal with them if you were elected or if your party was elected, as well as any matters about yourself that you think are important. Kia ora Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shaina Bort. I'm the Deputy Leader of the Opportunities Party, and I'm running here in the North Shore electorate. I joined TOP because it's time we tackle the big issues our country is facing, instead of either ignoring them or throwing money at the symptoms, which is all we have had from this red, blue rewind of the last 30 years. So my background is in law, I was a civil litigator and a Crown Prosecutor here in Auckland and I realised very quickly that the criminal justice system and those who come through it are symptoms of societal issues that are not being dealt with. So when I looked around, TOP was the only party I could find really focused on the underlying drivers of our issue. <coughs> whether it's rising inequality, rising child poverty, or housing unaffordability, which have all been getting consistently worse for the past 30 years. Telling you about our housing crisis is not new to you, but it's not a new crisis either. It has been getting worse for 30 years. Under National and Labour, it makes no difference. In the last three years alone, house prices have risen 27%, and our social housing waitlist has tripled. We need to deal with the real drivers of this. And the only thing that all parties seem to agree on right now is that we need to reform the RNA to fix housing. That is only a part of the puzzle. It's a part we need to address, but it's the only thing they're prepared to talk about. What we need are people with the courage to follow the solutions and listen to the evidence of what will work. This is from the tax working group in 2018 that got completely ignored. 
There is a huge hole in our tax system, a huge distortion that drives demand into investing into housing, demand drives up prices, instead of encouraging speculators and investors to put that money in businesses. It is a huge cause of our housing crisis in this country and tops the only party talking about it. We need to fix housing. Another huge policy at the top is our universal basic income, and I'm going to talk about that more today. We need to remove the huge welfare trap in our current system that punishes beneficiaries when they start to work. We need to incentivize and support people as they work, instead of make, making them work for between two and four dollars that the current system does. A UBI is dignity, and it rewards you when you work. It gets rid of that punitive stress that you get when you have to deal with wins. We need to really rethink what's going on in this country, and we can't continue doing what's not working. So, two ticks top. Next speaker is Elizabeth Rawlings for the Green Party. Welcome. My name is Elizabeth Rawlings. I'm standing as Green Party candidate for the North Shore. I have a degree in political studies and have worked in educational publishing and online learning design. I joined the Green Party before the 2017 election and helped with door knocking and leafleting in my local area of Devonport. I've been inspired by the many young people who've been involved in the school strikes for climate. I want to urge them to party vote green in what will be their first election. The Green Party is standing on three major policy plans, healthy environment, sustainable environment, economy, and fair society. My priorities for the North Shore would be public transport. The Green Party has announced its future of transport plan with light rail and more buses and ferries to the shore. A second harbour crossing will extend light rail to Tampuna and Albany. We will work with companies such as EV Maritime to develop <laughs> electric ferries as technology used in developing the America's Cup boats. I generally travel to the CBD by ferry. However, I realise it's an expensive way to travel. The Greens will introduce a nationwide Go Anywhere transport pass with free travel for under 18s and over 65s and half price for students. If we're going to rack up billions of dollars of debt for future generations to pay off, it should be spent on projects that will benefit our children and grandchildren. In government, Green Party MPs help to secure funding to create thousands of nature-based jobs over the next few <coughs> years. The $1.3 billion program will bring long-term ecosystem benefits by restoring wetlands and enhancing predator control. All of this will contribute to the green economic recovery. We will promote a circular economy where more goods are rescued and recycled. The Green Party will actively support sustainable industries and knowledge-based innovation. The Greens will continue to invest in trade, training and infrastructure projects. We are committed to adding more female-dominated industries to the free trade training scheme. As a learning designer working in the politics sector, I will continue to promote opportunities for young people through my professional networks. Clean swimmable beaches. I enjoy swimming in the sea, and I expect many of you do too. In cities, the Green Party will work with councils to improve soft infrastructure, to reduce runoff, equip homes with rainwater tanks, and require large buildings to include grey water recycling. The Greens will support local marine conservation efforts with a $10 million a year for a community coastal cleanup fund. This Saturday, I will join the Forest and Birds Vote for Nature Beach Cleanup at Little Shore Bay. Uh, this next speaker is Romeo Dunn. Good afternoon to all in the hall. So, good afternoon to those who are listening to us. Um, I'd like to start off by giving you some of my qualifications because uh, one of the things I heard from the community is they don't know me that much. 
Um, I'm, I have a degree in forest products engineering. I have two master degrees, one in forestry and one uh, MBA from <coughs> university. Um, I was awarded the uh, most outstanding alumnus by my alma mater because I became published as an academic author in the UK when I was 29. Uh, as a forester, the environment is really, really, really close to me. My mom, my dad, my sister, and even my granddad. We come from a long line of foresters. Um, Career-wise, I was a university instructor for seven years. I was technical training officer for the European Community ASEAN project in Kuala Lumpur. For 20 years, or more than 20 years actually, I was editor slash editor in, <coughs> editor in chief uh, for more than 20 years. And that includes a stint as political reporter and business reporter with Fairfax Media, that's started at Kodak Sensor and as editor of New Zealand Engineering News. And I launched a publication here called New Zealand Infrastructure. So when I talk about engineering infrastructure, it's, it's normal for me. Um, business experience, <clears throat> my wife and I we have been running our own businesses for more than 20 years. Um, so we have a skin in the game as a small and medium enterprise. So when I talk about this in as minutes, it's again me. Uh, um, we used to own a Montessori school for preschoolers and elementary school children. And we used to run and operate an out of school care. Um, this was at St. Dominic's Black House Bay and uh, St. Mary's Avondale. So the care, the welfare of children is again top priority for us, having been in that space for more than 15 years. In the community uh, space, I am a trustee with Foundation North. Uh, that's the, the trust that has 1.4 billion dollars for the communities of Oakland and Northland. And being there has allowed me to work with many different communities. I work with, uh, uh, I also work with the churches. I work um, with interfaith groups, ecumenical groups. I have been a speaker with the Oakland Regional Migrant Services. As you see, I'm a migrant. I'm in the space as well. And I've been uh, looking into the integration of migrants to, to New Zealand. Uh, by the way, when the time is up, please wave at me because I, I'm wearing my hearing aid and I might not be able to hear you. Uh, <laughs> sorry about that. So what does this, what does this mean to, to you who's listening to me now? It means that I am capable of listening to you. I'm capable of gathering the information that you will bring me and we can bring that to Parliament. It's not only me. Thank you. It's not only me, but it's us. I'm, I'm going to listen to you and I'll take our concerns in North Shore. The Parliament. Thank you. Next and final speaker to the North Shore uh, electorate is Simon Watts. Today. Thank you. Thank you. One of those candidates is Water sitting behind Romney. Mm -hmm. Right, well, kia ora, uh, and good afternoon, everyone, and welcome along here to uh, take a premium here on the North Shore. My name is Simon Watts, and I'm the new National Party candidate uh, for the North Shore. It's an absolute pleasure uh, to be able to represent uh, and hopefully represent uh, after the election on the 17th of October this amazing lecture and probably one of the best places to live, raise a family, retire and grow a business anywhere in the country. Sorry, North Coast, but uh, I think we're biased as we go. Look, in terms of my background, there's a question for you, Dave, around community involvement. So I'm host uh, of the uh, New Zealand Diabetes New Zealand Trust Board at a national level and also on the Auckland Diabetes uh, Trust Board up until the date of the election. And then also I'm a frontline ambulance officer with St John. I've been a member of St John uh, for over 10 years, both in London and here in the North Shore. I mentor and train and work frontline as an emergency ambulance officer with St John. I'm um, also qualified in paramedicine for a degree at AUT. So I do a clinical shift every month, including ones during lockdown and level four. In terms of my background and experience, I'm a chartered accountant. I've worked globally for world uh, leading and scale uh, organizations from London to Vancouver to Dublin, uh, to India, to Poland, to Singapore. So I have a broad global perspective. I've been banking and finance work for Deloitte, uh, so I understand numbers. I'm also a father of two young boys. So when you talk about education, I understand that. Uh, and I'm obviously also a husband as well. In terms of the key issues for North Shore, three, well, there's actually five key issues, but the ones that I want to talk about, travel congestion, uh, we've had an announcement from Auckland Council to stop Stanley Bay Theory permanently. 
Look, ladies and gentlemen, we need more ferry services to the North Shore, not less. Yeah, right. So we need to be focusing on investment, national sort of clear strategy and a clear funding around ferry infrastructure, one of the key enablers, and also bring electric ferries, which is critically important for our environmental aspect. Second aspect is also creating jobs and employment. We're in the biggest economic crisis in a decade, or oh, decade, sorry, 160 years, uh, and we need to be able to support our people. And this will come into other questions later on around how we support, particularly those in poverty as well. And lastly, in terms of health infrastructure, this is an area as a deputy CFO of Waitamata District Health Board for over three years. I understand the health system and the public system uh, you know, in depth. And we need significantly more infrastructure. There's generational infrastructure, particularly in health, because as we've seen this year, without health, our economy doesn't have any basis. And so we've got to be critically, you know, we've really got to be focusing on that infrastructure spend, and not only in health, but also in education, which is not started on wastewater infrastructure, because that's why we've got more sewage going out to our beaches in yeah. Norfolk. And it is not acceptable to check an app before I take my kids swimming in my local beach. That's right. And I don't think that's an expectation of any Kiwi. I'm going to get those for the three years. So thanks very much for your time. Uh, Party Vote National, Simon Walsh North Shore. Thanks very much for coming. Thanks, Simon. Well, that's the North Shore team. We can now see uh, ourselves switch to North Coat and see whether they can get them to the other side of the field. <laughs> uh, with uh, Dan Bidwa, the current uh, Member of Parliament for North Coat, standing for National. Dan, we'll first up. Sorry, Tim. Uh, well, kia ora koutou katoa, everybody. I just want to start off by acknowledging you all. Uh, you guys represent organisations that do a huge amount uh, for our community on the shore, and you know that vulnerability doesn't segregate by electorate. So thank you very much. It's really great to see uh, some of the familiar faces of our community. My name is Dan Bidwai, and I need two ticks blue from you at this election, your candidate vote and your party vote. Just a little bit about me. Uh, I'm the incumbent MP. I love the North Coast electorate. It is the best place to live and grow up on the North Shore. Um, as your current incumbent MP, I know how to get results in Wellington and, dare I say, with Auckland Council. Uh, I'm the most experienced candidate standing with a degree in economics and public policy from Harvard University. I've also got three degrees here at the University of Auckland. Like my great colleague Simon Watts, I've lived and experienced the world in Paris, in Kuala Lumpur, in the States, and also in Central Asia. So I've seen a lot of different contexts, and I want to bring that to bear on some of the challenges that we face as the North Shore community. So let's talk about the challenges that I think we face. So I think there's three big challenges on the shore that I want to work with all of the national MPs uh, very much on. The first is transport. Yes, we do need to get started on that second half of crossing. National is the only party that's committed to planning in our first term and can start the construction in our second term. Sky Park, let's get on and do that, but that ain't going to resolve the congestion challenges that we face either. Uh, Simon's talked about um, theories. It's a fantastic opportunity. Three million dollars uh, that National has been, uh, committed to theories on the North Shore. The second challenge is around the environment, wastewater infrastructure. We've got challenges in Little Shoal Bay with coastal erosion. We've got Kauri dieback is a serious issue in my community. It's something I want to work with your organisations on very much. And the final thing is around the COVID era and jobs. And I think National has got a fantastic plan to get our community moving, to build our economy, because you know what? We will come from the private sector. Simon, myself, Erica, and Jake Bazan, who will all be on the North Shore as your National MP. So I'd love your support, our lecture vote, and party vote at this election. Thank you. Uh, the next candidate is Bill Dyer for the New Conservatives. Thank you, today, and you know, just to point to Dan, I'd like to acknowledge all the new people too and, and the work that you're putting into our community. Um, so we're all here to make New Zealand a better place. Um, and for me, it's a real pleasure to be standing for the first time in my life as a political candidate, and I'm standing in Northcote, which I think is a great area. It's somewhere where I've spent a lot of my adult life, and I lived in Glenfield and Beach Haven. Um, a little bit about me, um, I'm currently the treasurer for my local church, um, bearing in mind that the first treasurer of a Christian group was Judas Iscariot, 
<laughs> so um, now, also up until recently, I was the treasurer for the Dolphins Basketball Club, which is one of the biggest basketball clubs on the North Shore, and I coach basketball um, at Long Bay College. Um, a little bit about our party. So we're similar to ACT in many ways in that we're very much a free market, small government, give you back your money kind of party, uh, right wing and our thinking like that. So. For instance, our policy is the first $20,000 you earn, you get tax free. $20,000 to $60,000, you only pay 17.5% on your tax. And we also, the other side of our philosophy, where we differ from ACT, is also we're very strong on good moral values. And um, we believe that, particularly in strengthening the traditional family and supporting marriage, we can build good, strong family homes. And one of the major problems in our society is family breakdown and um, you know, children and teens getting into a lot of trouble because they don't come from a strong home where their mother or father really support them. So we want to do whatever we can to build a family home as a bedrock of our society. Um, with that in mind, three main things for the North Shore region, uh, for North Cape. Number one, I think mainly, mainly would be poverty and what many people have to deal with. Poverty, crime, drug dependence, youth suicide. Again, that goes back to what we believe, in that by building good, strong family homes, the mother and father have, um, rather than replacing it with government departments, a family home can provide the best uh, background for, for children to keep them out of trouble. Um, and then the, big, the next biggest one, of course, is transport, and that's probably going to be done for me today here. Just to say that we back the uh, ATAP, which is the Open Transport Alignment Project, particularly with building a light rail network on the North Shore and a light rail tunnel between Takapuna and, um, and um, Britomart. And number three, um, for me, I believe, again, the house prices. You know, we've seen house prices go from the three times the average wage in the 1990s in Auckland up to nine times the average wage now. And people like my, my own son, who's nearly 30, he's, when's he ever going to be able to afford to buy a house? So, and you management across universities, Wananga and in trades training. And so my little piece, my little koha to our local community is I want to see better tertiary options across the North Shore. We have two universities, we don't have any polytechs or PTEs over here, nor do we have uh, trades training. I want to lead that for us, I want to champion that particular kaupapa because when 70% of our school leavers uh, aren't going on to university education. What we want to create is an opportunity for people to work and learn here in North Coast and across the North Shore. Noreo, tēnā koutou. Well, that was a great introduction, wasn't it, from all those candidates so you know a bit more about them. What I want to do now is just ask uh, the first question, which is sort of semi-covered by the introductions, but maybe the candidates could just focus a little bit more clearly on what the Devonport Peninsula Trust wanted to hear from uh, the candidates. And Maria Treat uh, T is here. Where's Maria? There she is. Maria, was just, I really think maybe focusing on second part of your question for the, for the one minute responses. Sure. So um, what we want to know is community-based organisations. Um, because the interest in here about candidates' community involvement, um, things like all the trustees, skills, sports, and local cookies, etc. Good, thanks. Okay, I thought this time we'd um, we'll still start with North Shore, but we'll go the other way around. Simon, would you start first? We'll just go from uh, bottom to top up. Yeah, make sure I covered it in my speech. You did, part yeah. of that. But um, well, just a quick reminder I'm a father, I've got two young boys, eight and ten, so obviously, uh, if any active boys are involved in a whole lot of sports, uh, and mm -hmm. basketball and football across. Uh, the North Shore. In terms of my uh, at a national level, I said Diabetes New Zealand, I'm a type 1 diabetic, I've been since I was 21 months old, 
Uh, so I understand the healthcare system from a patient perspective as well. And my role at a government's level at a national level is really trying to drive awareness around diabetes, which impacts particularly our Maori and Pacific populations here in Auckland. Uh, and that is something that I'm very passionate about driving real outcomes linked to policy. Uh, the other aspect is obviously St John, um, our frontline ambulance officer. So when people talk about mold growing on the roof of houses in South Auckland and kids suffering from breathing issues because of that, I understand that because I go into those houses at 3am and see the reality of some of the social issues that we face within this city. So while I've got a banking and finance and accounting background and people box you and go, he's that corporate guy who's done that nice stuff, I've also got a very, very and practical perspective of what some of the challenges are we have within our communities, and I want to do something about it. Mm. Good. Thank you, Simon. Okay, Robin, you <laughs> on that point. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for that. There are two levels where I am involved in the community. The first level is on governance, and part of that is being uh, trusting with Foundation North, as I mentioned earlier. We normally give about $45 million dollars to community groups. And I believe many of the leaders here have been beneficiaries uh, of that money that is entrusted for the benefit of Auckland and Northland. That's one of them. I'm uh, still part of governance. I've been, as I said, uh, uh, I've been working with many churches actually, and one of them with the Diocese of Auckland, uh, where I represented the migrant communities as advisor to um, Bishop Patrick Dunn at the time, uh, before I went to the politics. The, the other one is on uh, doing lecturing on arms for migrant communities. Um, I also do work at operational level, and part of that is planting trees. Uh, I have documented some of the trees that I have, I have planted in North Shore, and hopefully I'll be able to see them grow um, because I love doing that. And as well, the other communities in North Shore who know that I work with them. Thank you. Uh, yes, well, I've lived on the Devonport Tapper Peninsula for nine years, and um, seven of those years I was on the PTA committee at Tapper Grammar School, where my son and daughter attended. Um, and we fundraised um, through speaker events and uh, annual dance, comedy, comedy night, and golf day. And uh, this fundraising went to provide extra sporting, performing arts, IT equipment, special needs facilities, and scholarships for students at the school. Um, I've also volunteered for Sculpture on Shore, which raises funds for Women's Refuge, and I fundraised for Breast Cancer Foundation, I'll be doing that again this month, and I'm a member of Devonport Library Associates, which holds book launches, debates, and speaker events at the Devonport Library. So I volunteered as a board member for a couple of years for an aged care facility near St. John's um, <coughs> at Shalom Court, a Jewish um, aged care facility. So um, that, that was my first experience working um, with aged care actually. And so that was um, quite the opposite of my previous experience where I had been um, before I went into the law. I um, did, was a dancer for years and was a dance teacher. Um, it was a school that used to be in Takapuna and then moved up to my own bay. And so um, we were always involved in um, putting on productions every year. And so that at um, Bruce Mason Theatre. And so I will find out we're going to get onto that kind of topic later on, but that's sort of my background. Thank you. Quite a few things. So I spoke with um, many years ago for my sins. I was on the board of trustees of the Act Party for a number of years, and I was party secretary for about, about five years. Uh, and that, you know, represents, I suppose, the grassroots of democracy in the country, working for political party trying to enact change. Um, I, was, I was on the Kaipatiki local board for, for a term, and as part of that, uh, I got to be on the board of the North Coast Citizen Centre uh, Management Trust in Ernie May Street, and I was instrumental when I was removed from the board in 2013, as I say. I stayed on that trust board and, and helped them um, um, change from the current structure over the Kaipatiki Community Facilities Trust, which is now uh, operates it. Um, I've been heavily involved in North Harbour Triathlon Club for five years. Um, I'm the past president of the club. Uh, I'm still on the committee and I help, help the club in arranging the annual swim run event they have down in the Takapuna Beach each summer, which I'm in the middle of uh, applying for a permit at the moment with the council on. 
And lastly, but not uh, the least, uh, as I said in my introduction, I'm on the uh, I'm on the um, the best one I've got at the minute. I think the uh, Westlake Foundation Charitable Trust, which is a, a charitable trust set up to help old boys at Westlake, and we're putting in place a, a business academy at Westlake Boys, which we're quite we're quite um, confident about, quite pleased, and happy about, and, uh, and I'm leading that process. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, look, I'm, I'll probably be the least of uh, uh, the volunteer. Uh, I don't do a lot of volunteering. I'll be pre perfectly honest about that. But I do attend a church who I support financially, and uh, they have some really great uh, um, uh, in initiatives, one being the Transformation Academy, and that's based in North Cope, and also the Dream Centre, which is... Um, uh, I think I've got that right the right way. They help out with homeless people in Queen Street, which I, I have seen a number of, and it's actually quite bad at the moment, uh, especially during COVID. Uh, so I financially support them, and they financially, or they, they help out uh, at a grassroots level. And uh, apart from that, uh, I did take my daughter through the WaterWise, uh, uh, became a WaterWise instructor at Food Bookie to help out there. That was a few years ago when she was in intermediate. And I've got a cap to prove it, so that was quite cool. <laughs> and so for me. Thank you, Bill. We'll switch to the North Coast team. Shannon, you're all first up on. Thanks very much. Um, it, it's my strength, actually. Uh, I started training student leaders at North Coast College in Greenfield uh, back in 2008. I moved here in 2010. Uh, and then since then, I've been actively in, been involved across our community. I'm now the chair of Birkdale Beach Haven Community Project, which runs our local community houses and a number of initiatives locally for young people and families. Um, and I'm also an active part of uh, Uruamo Amo Marangahake, which is the marae development down at Beach Haven, and Awataha Marae over here in North Coast. Um, I've been a committee member of Auckland Central Branch Forest of Earth for about three years now, and that's where I've also developed quite an um, interest and also nervousness about the state of our environment. Um, that's just, we do a lot of like submissions and planting, um, bush cleanups, and then I'm sorry, I was co president for about a year and then secretary for two years. I was doing the minutes. <laughs> um, and then outside of that committee, I've just, I've Quite involved in communities going to protests that I believe in. I was a strike, um, teacher strike. Um, I went to the recent protests at Avondale for the canal for trees, the, the job trying to cut down the trees there. Um, and I think also through my involvement with Forest of Bird, I really um, realized that we need a government that supports tree protection being put back into our and to local councils so we don't have so many of our beautiful trees being taken down. Thank you. And Bill, next, sorry. Yeah. Oh, hi. Yeah, just as I said before, um, I, I was a treasurer for the Dolphins Basketball Club, which is probably the biggest club on the shore. We've got about 250 members. Um, I just had to drop it for this campaign because I just had too much on my plate. I'm um, also a church treasurer for my local church. Uh, prior to that, I, was, uh, I worked for some time with the uh, Save the Children managing the shop and tap cleaner. And, Way back, I was with the Greens when they first got going in England in 1990. Thank you. Yeah. So, so one of the biggest things I'm passionate about is inspiring our youth to achieve an education. And that comes from a personal experience of dropping out of high school in New Zealand at 15 and somehow making my way to Harvard University. So in the seven years I was abroad, I got involved with the Sepeda Blake Trust. And that every year gives uh, the opportunity for school kids to get to know you. So zoom in online to these school classrooms and uh, just give them a sense of what it was like being an economist and a uh, senior executive and getting to know foreign countries. Uh, and I'll continue that in my role in, uh, as an MP, getting to know as many school children as possible and just saying, hey, if you're not engaged in education, you absolutely can achieve. You just got to find what's uh, really passionate. Uh, with you. So that's the first thing. The second thing is certainly as an MP getting involved in everything, Rotary Clubs, um, Pestry Club Paddocky, the Environment Paddocky Project, uh, Planting Trees, a uh, hell of a lot of great things out there. And I just kind of dive in and help out where I can. Thank you. 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 Th
The next thing was the environment, and we've got a question here from the Kaipataki Environment Centre and Ben Sheeran. Ben here? Ben's not here. Okay. So the question from uh, Kaipataki is, can you tell us about one individual action you've taken that will help New Zealand transition to a low carbon future? So back to... Uh, North Shore and Mike. We'll start the alphabet the other way. Okay. Um, okay. Well, look, I can't actually name one individual action because so someone asked me this last night. And uh, um, look, a lot of this, uh, you know, carbon uh, neutral and um, the, the goals for climate change. Uh, the company, we, we don't actually personally agree with this. Uh, I, I don't personally agree with it because there's a lot of science that disputes. Uh, a lot of what's been told in the media. I have spent 25 years in the media, so I do know how it works uh, and then widely read on the subject. Uh, the, as I said before, 90% of you won't like our policies, and one of them is to get rid of the ETS and save ourselves uh, $1.2 billion of tax that's going to go offshore. So that's very welcome. So I'm a carbon neutral. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Nick, your next, please. Uh, I can name one thing, and um, not so much in, in winter because weather's a bit dreadful, but I, I go around to work regularly in summer, so I don't live, I live probably three and a half kilometres from my office, I'm on a road bike, uh, and I, when we move buildings, I make sure I shower and stuff, so I can cycle and run to work, and that's how I get to work mostly uh, over summer, which of course you know, reduces uh, my carbon, personal carbon footprint, that's one thing I do do. Good one. Uh, Shaka. I'm hoping you guys care more about the top's plan for climate change than me personally, which is to listen to the science and listen to the evidence. And the um, Commissioner for the Environment has given advice as to how we can have the best gains fastest. And they have said that go for the low hanging fruit, which is not move into renewable energy. That's not what you're going to do. So instead of going from the goal of 2035, the government moved to forward to 2030 not listening to the advice. What they have said instead is focus on energy efficiency, which is boring. I get that you can't cut red tape, you can't cut your ribbon or whatever you want to do. But that is how we're going to make the best gains fastest. It's good for our homes and our businesses, healthy homes and cheaper electricity bills for our homes and businesses. But also we need to get fossil fuel emissions down to zero as soon as possible. We, and the advice is to stop using pine trees as a way to offset those emissions. Instead, only use agricultural emissions to do that. That's top's policy. Uh, for several years, I've ordered a regular box of fresh produce from Ubi, just out of our own backyards. They source food from small local producers and deliver it to households and businesses throughout Auckland and Waikato. Their seasonal fruit and vegetables are mostly organic or minimal sprays, and the company has a mission to put small-scale sustainable farming at the heart of our food system. I also buy kiwi, I buy kiwi made when shopping for clothes, supporting companies such as Allbirds <laughs> for sustainable shoes and mower business based in Grey Lynn that has designed and made clothes in Manitoba since the late 1980s. No, I'm still <laughs> Some of their clothes. This creates more jobs for New Zealanders and a lower carbon footprint for the fashion industry. Thank you. Um, I drive around to get a hybrid van. I hope that counts. <laughs> and number two, I have been involved in many tree, plant, tree planting activities with different groups. But the most important thing for me is leveraging on the connection that I have with, for example, Foundation North, GIFT, uh, the fund, seven million fund that we're using to, to bring back the Maori of Arabica, for example, the biggest body of water that is right in front of our doorstep. So uh, what I'm doing is I'm bringing in people. Some of you might have attended that event that I hosted uh, three weeks or four weeks ago here in uh, Dev sorry in Devonport, and I brought with me the owners of uh, the noises. 
and I allow them to share their experiences so that more people will get to know about what individual groups and individuals are doing in that space to bring back the Maori of Oracle. So, thank you. Right. I guess one of the advantages of being a CFO at the local THB is, is that you have the participate in the business cases over the line to get things done. We want to get it focused on how we move to this. So something specifically is around the facilitation of conversion of the fleet that the DHB has in terms of into EV vehicles. DHB carried all short 400 vehicles. Wadamata, 200, oh, sorry, counties Manica, we were always good, also work about 250. The challenge is, though, that the capital models funding the DHP does not allow them to prioritise that type of funding because the EV vehicles are too expensive. We need to create a second-hand market for that, and the national policy has released some real practical policy in order to create and incentivise people to buy EVs to be able to create that second-hand market. That would allow the government to be able to start moving their fleets, and that's a transition that we need, and that's a specific example of involving. Okay. All right, so the biggest thing I've done to reduce uh, CO2 emissions is eat less red meat. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I probably eat about uh, once or twice a month red meat. Um, my sister, my fiance, she's a sustainability manager, did her master's in climate analysis, wants to do a PhD in climate finance. She has me writing her Nissan Leaf in, um, when I'm not driving my car. It's a red car, so uh, that is a big difference for me. Is that uh, and, and lastly, is um, she's going to be calculating my emissions, and we're going to try and offset that uh, on a yearly basis. So I think there's a hell of a lot that you as an individual can do. It doesn't take a lot of money to offset. So um, power to the individual, I say. Thank you. Yeah, good. Uh, as my colleague here said, uh, New Conservative maintains a healthy scepticism towards the whole climate change issue. Um, we, we still see that there needs to be a debate where we see the other side of the issue, particularly how it's going to impact on our economy. For instance, the New Zealand Emissions Trading Scheme wants to gradually replace agriculture with forestry. And that may sound great. Um, the reason is because uh, agriculture is, is giving out 48% of our greenhouse gas emissions in the form of um, methane. Um, so we're going to replace agriculture with forestry. And what we're doing now is we're transferring our focus on agriculture from producing food which feeds 40 million people onto forestry. And forestry is a long term thing. So we plant these trees now, and they, they stand here for 30 years, earning us absolutely nothing. And at the same time, forestry only takes one seventh of the uh, labor that farming does. So we've, we've cut our farming industry by seven times in terms of labor. So we're going to create unemployment and we're going to harm our um, farming communities through doing this. So we, we still see that you have to balance that against the possibility of rising sea levels. So there's a debate that has to continue. It's not just climate change and that's After the debate last night, you know, Stephanie and Dan um, agreed that eating less red meat is a good way for us individually um, to have also got a carbon emission. Um, I myself have been vegetarian for five years, today, like really about eight years ago, after doing an international environmental law paper at Auckland University. Um, started out really for environmental reasons, so I've been out kind of an animal welfare advocate too, and I believe industrial farm means shopping. And um, another thing I do is I buy basically all my clothes from op shops now. Everything I'm wearing is from an op shop. Um, and then I also buy a quarantine food. Uh, well, as we move out of COVID-19, what we'll see is, is high infrastructure spend uh, from the next government. And uh, something that I've personally championed within our party is the commitment, the ongoing commitment to Skypass. For five years I've campaigned on that Kokopa. Uh, transport options are really important to our green future and our, and our transport infrastructure in Auckland. Uh, under Labour, we've committed to that, we've committed in consecutive elections, we've now funded it, we've redesigned the work, not just to be across the bridge, but up to Albany and across to Takapuna, so that people can walk and cycle across the, the bridge. It's only under Labour, and let me be very clear, only under Labour, Will we get the sky path going, the northern pathway, and will we and we will progress walking and cycling under the bridge? It isn't a national plan. Just to be clear, they haven't uh, included in their finances. Only under Labour will get it done. Now, 
to switch to the app. So we have two questions. One is from the Rose Centre. And Siobhan here? Yes, yeah. good. And uh, we've got a, a, a related question from the Lake House Arts Centre with uh, Gray. Is Gray here? Okay. Siobhan, you read out yours? The government can place many arts community groups support possibilities during COVID, but none of these issues come to venues, which means artists can survive, but most of their community locations are now in financial jeopardy. How would your party like to have Okay, and from Lake House Art Centre. Lately, the art the Arts Centre has a, a funding contract with Auckland Council to deliver arts and cultural programs to the community. However, the model inherited by the super city is directly outdated and has huge inequity between arts facilities. In some comparisons, Lake House Arts receives 10% of the funding of other Auckland facilities while delivering the same, if not more, programs and being one of the top five visited art centres in the region. If elected, how can the candidates influence Auckland Council? To address the inequity in the funding of arts and culture and community. So let's go backwards here. We'll start with um, um, Simon on this matter for the North Shore. We'll go back up the list. Yes, yeah, so two parts. One, arts and culture con uh, contributes a significant amount of financial uh, aspect to our New Zealand economy. It draws about 90,000 jobs, and in comparison, say, sport and rec, which is around 50,000. So in terms of key aspect, one is the protection of our borders. I think you know the going back into COVID and going back into lockdowns is one of the key aspects we need to protect against. The National have got a very clear policy around establishment of a new government agency to ensure we don't have leverage through our borders of COVID, which relates to the lockdowns. Second part of the question uh, relates to Auckland Council. Look, the performance of Auckland Council is not at the level at which we require. There is a number of examples where we've seen wastage of spending, and the national government have been very clear that we would undertake an extensive review of Auckland Council, focused on increasing its performance. Uh, and that is critically important to ensure that our party of tax dollars, particularly here on the North Shore, we get some of that back, because at the moment that's not the case. Mm -hmm. uh, Robbie, you're next. Thank you. Before I came here, I actually came from uh, the Bump House and had a chat with Peter, Bre Peter there, who is the chair of, uh, of the Bump House Trust. And after this, we'll be heading to the Lake House because uh, we'll be talking to Greg as well. And just to show the commitment that I have in the arts as well, not only because my wife is a watercolor artist, but that says a lot, uh, says a lot as well. <laughs> but because I, I believe that the art, which is the softer side of the product, can help us develop products that are physically, say, um, not beautiful to look at, right? Because an artist can transform a product into something that can be bought by the public. That's why we have user interface. And only artists can do that. We need the arts to make sure that the products that we develop are going to be good and going to be bought by the public and the whole world. Thank you. Well, I realize that the Rose Center is a valuable asset to the Balmore community and it should have been supported through the pandemic. The Greens will collaborate with the council, community groups and EWI to ensure that there are enough venues for all forms of art and that these venues are accessible to everyone. I was at Lake House Arts uh, just 10 days ago for a friend's exhibition and um, I've been to many great exhibitions and events there over the years. I would talk to members of the staff and board and take their concerns to Auckland Council. Funding allocation should be decided on a fair comparison across Auckland including the number of visitors and the number of programs delivered, such as classes, exhibitions and events, which Lake House obviously did a lot of. This would bring, um, they would put them on a level playing field. Arts partners are integral to the ongoing health and recovery of communities, but it's difficult to contribute if you're disadvantaged from a funding perspective. I would make the case for fairer funding to those involved in arts facilities and councils. Thank you. 
<coughs> so the first part of the question actually relates to TOPS mental health policy because community things like community arts and community theatre that is a huge place where people come together to have a sense of connection, community, and belonging. And so that is why TOP has a real focus on providing more funding to those organisations so that people have somewhere to go. In, in relation to the second question, it really highlights a huge issue with the Council's overall huge funding deficit in general. And uh, TOP has a huge focus to, to deal with this and to address it because at the moment, councils are responsible for about 40% of the infrastructure. But they've only been left with about 7% of the revenue they actually need to look after and maintain it. Not to mention that the huge deficit that's clearly created. So for TOP, a part of the way to get more funding to councils is to ring fence the GST on new developments. So that there's a new fund available for councils to access. Thank you. Thank you. Three, three solutions, I think. I think Simon made a good point about uh, COVID lockdowns. We, we can't afford as a country, even as a region, to have any more COVID lockdowns and uh, act as a policy to follow the smart model of Taiwan to ensure that you know, there are no more lockdowns so that every organisation such as this uh, and other funding groups can, can actually meet them and keep their businesses going. That's the first thing. The second thing is to, to allow more money to be into the economy and to, and to fund organisations um, that we talked about. We need a really, really strong economy. Uh, with a strong economy, more taxpayers, more people at work, uh, companies that are profitable pay more tax, there's more money available to fund. So a, a very strong economy is fundamental to all of it. Um, and the third thing, I think, in terms of Auckland Council, it sort of saddens me a bit to see there's still inequity. I know I've seen Lindsay Moore over there. We were on the local board in 2010. We went through a torment <coughs> trying to put an equitable funding policy in place. It looks like it's still not there. Um, one, of my, one of my things, perhaps, you know, the National Party is elected, and I do a review of, of the council, is I would like to see more, um, more um, funding of local boards. I like to see local boards have more of their money for themselves to decide where they spend it rather than go cap in hand to the, to the council every year for the plans. Thank you, Mike. Uh, well, look, the New Conservatives have stated clearly that we would not support any more lockdowns. We would, that would be our policy, no more lockdowns, which would give uh, businesses and uh, trusts such as this and uh, venues certainty to be able to do what they need to do. Uh, and secondly, I would also uh, would, would support uh, the local candidates like Simon who would uh, force a review of Auckland Council and their spending and how they fund uh, different organisations. So it's uh, outstanding. Good, the Norfolk team. I think we start backwards with Shannon um, this time, please. Thank you. I, I guess one of the questions for the arts sector on the shore is, is do you feel that you have a strong enough voice and with central government? And that's what I'm proposing, should I be elected as our local MP, is that we get to have the opportunity to talk about and bring people together about the issues that are important. Yes, there is Auckland Council. I've got relationships with our two, our two councillors. They're very, very much aligned to the work that we're doing. But we've also got to bring in what's uh, central government's responsibility to supporting our arts sector. And we saw that with the wage subsidy throughout COVID-19 and that supported people in their jobs. And thankfully, that included our art sectors and contractors as well. That was so important. But I accept that under venues, that's incredibly challenging. Uh, we had Kamal <coughs> Sepuloni, who's our Associate Minister of Arts here uh, today, and we are doing some visits um, across the shore. But um, the thing that's important here, and, and I used to um, produce youth theatre back in the day with Massive, so it was something that I'm very, very passionate about that as we create a destination North Coast, that we've got to bring our art sector as a part of that. We have an opportunity to celebrate our, our, our diversity uh, across this community, and that's what I'll bring. Thank you. Natasha. I don't have much more to add. Um, I think we've covered it pretty well. Um, I do remember the emergency budget for the Auckland Council and doing submissions on that, and the Green Party did put together um, a uh, template for submissions saying why aren't we increasing rates a bit more to keep things alive that really need, that needed to be. Um, our rates have been quite stagnant and that's, it is always an issue of funding and I think rates could go up in Auckland so that we don't lose any of these facilities that we all love. Um, another, I think that was all I was going to say. Yeah, that's all I was going to add. I think that 
we need to, and oh, I'm sorry, also um, increase the limit, borrowing limit that council could have um, undertaken because there was a cap on that, so they weren't able to actually borrow anymore. And if they can't borrow anymore, the things would just weren't able to survive, and that was a problem. So we did have to, I think that would have been a bit of a sensible solution. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, as I said before, new conservatives policy is quite right wing. We give you back your rate money and tax money, put it back in your pocket, and you spend it how you want. So, um, in the recent uh, COVID lockdown, our Prime Minister uh, put $100 million into um, arts and culture. Uh, yeah, but that's $100 million out of your pocket. So, as I said before, we would cut your income tax, and then you would use your 5 or 10 or $20 to go along to the lake house if they put on a really good display, or go along to Rose Theatre if they're putting on a play rather than take the money from you, give it to them, and then they can do whatever they like. So we're free market. Okay, Dan. Uh, yes, absolutely acknowledge the challenging time for many uh, arts, culture, and community organisations out there. Um, so what's the solution? I absolutely agree with Simon. We just cannot keep going in and out of lockdown. So I'm really confident about the nation's policy to make sure we keep COVID out, and we just can't keep doing that. Second thing on the Auckland Council, absolutely support the um, review. I'd like to see personally more powers and ability uh, devolved to local boards. I think that that's uh, something I'd like to see in the future. But also I think um, it's really important to get on with your local board and your council and amplify their efforts. And I think with me at the helm in the fantastic community of North Coast, you've seen someone that actually amplifies the efforts of the local board, gives way to it, gets out there, fronts it, and makes sure that people in the community absolutely are aware of the challenges that you face uh, and puts pressure on council to step up their funding. Thank you. So we move to, to, a, to a new theme, and I'm feeling a bit like Patrick Gower here, just quick by a system. <laughs> so we've got housing now, and what I'd like to do this time is just start with the North Coast people first, and in particular because uh, Shannon unfortunately has to leave uh, uh, a bit early, so when he slips away, um, that's the reason he's not uh, walking away from me. So we're three housing questions, one is from the North Shore CMA, is Rachel here? Rachel, could you read that one please? Yes, um, what would you uh, do to improve housing accessibility and affordability, particularly for older New Zealanders with a view that the ageing population is going to have to increase? And then, uh, is, uh, Jan Rutland here? I didn't see Jan. No, no, uh, oh, thanks. Could you read out Jan's question? Yep. Jan is from, she runs DePaul House. Yep. So we would like to know what do you, what would you do in the next three years to change housing and income disparity? on the North Shore, and what would you do to help those most vulnerable that is different from what is already happening? And third question is from Gabriel Pai. Gabriel's not here. Gabriel's not here, okay. North Shore Housing Trust asks, we're aware that there are, is a growing housing issue here on the shore. Many young disabled people are being forced to live in other parts of Auckland when they move out of home. What will you do to ensure that they can remain close to family and friends. So that's a focus on housing for the disabled. So starting with North Coast, um, we'll start with Dan. If you want to have a crack at those, Dan, please. Yes, so look, there's three different questions there and really only a minute to answer. But um, look, we do need absolutely more affordable homes. And uh, let's be clear, the North Coast development is a fantastic project and something that the previous national government started, uh, 1,200 homes. This current government's taken it to 1,500, but actually there's been delays in getting those houses built because of those changes. So I think that that is absolutely key. With National, uh, we've come out with our Rent to Buy scheme, which is a fantastic opportunity uh, to give those in state homes a chance to get a leg up and uh, hope, uh, get into our first home. I absolutely want to acknowledge the Tipple House. I'm a massive fan uh, of that great organisation, and I do think that we need to support these organisations, community organisations, who do a fantastic job of providing uh, emergency and transitional housing for our communities, but they are really struggling with resources. So we'd like to see that beefed up and uh, certainly push the community housing providers in this area. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Phil. Housing. Housing. Um, I'd like to convince the socialists among us today that the free market is a wonderful thing, um, particularly with housing. Now, the problem is the free market 
can't keep up with the demand for housing. We've got demand up here, but supply is down here. And as I said before, you conservative would lock out all the immigration that's coming in and driving our house prices up until the demand for housing brings the supply back up. So people like my son who can't afford a house and yet he's a builder, he will, he will, his demand is on him to go and build more houses. We need to get it back down to where it was in the late 80s when it was three times the average wage. It's now nine times. So obviously it's way beyond people's reach. And it's not just buying a house, it's also renting a house, because house rents are tied to house prices. And, and the open market from the overseas and the fact that people are coming in and speculating is what's driven, driven it way beyond free market, the free market mechanism. Okay, Natasha. <laughs> The Green Party support a lot more housing being built and uh, rent on schemes as well. Um, they want to reduce the amount of developments of private sales so that they're with community groups and more rent on and schemes. Um, and so I'm trying to touch on each of the questions. Um, housing income disparities. Um, housing income disparities, the Green Party, I'm sure you've all heard about it, has put out a really big tax reform um, policy to with the wealth tax of 1% over a million dollars of wealth and 2% over 2 million, and that money is to go back into housing to be able to make housing more affordable and build more houses. Um, for people, for young disabled people, uh, the Green Party policy is that all new social housing should be accessible and should have to, you have, should have to apply um, for consent for it to not be for each specific housing. Um, and that would allow people to remain close to their friends and family because the Green Party acknowledge and understand that disabilities are made by barriers and we can, as a government, remove those, lost those barriers. Thank you. Shannon. <laughs> Um, under Labor, we've got all land started building, building houses. In the Clark government, that initiated the North Coast housing development. Uh, let's be very clear about that. We saw a seven year delay before National done anything about that policy and got it off the ground. And this audience knows all about the poor housing situation under the previous government. I'm in a no nonsense mood with this, with this community. The thing is, is we've built a number of houses and continue to build over 1,500 houses in our North Coast community alone. What's important in that, and people here know, is that we, we need to protect the right mix of housing in place. We need to ensure that social housing is available across all of our community. And there's a bit of anxiety coming on, coming in around that, because there's so many being built, up to 350 at the moment. And somebody's got to lead that out in our community and help develop an, an inclusive community there. We need to ensure we have more affordable homes locally. That becomes the priority and then additional on the market. If it was under national, it would be all on the market. There'd be no state houses. They would have sold them off. Thank you. Mark Brewer is number one. Thank you. So I don't really have much to add apart from what Bill said and also uh, and the other speakers have talked about doing something with the RMA. Uh, compliance costs are ridiculous. Uh, my name is a drain layer. He said years, uh, 15 years ago it was about $800 to get a water meter installed. It's now $15,000. That's ridiculous. So we need to look at compliance costs. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Good. Thanks. Nick, you're up next on housing. Yeah, um, one minute to address this doesn't really do it justice. Essentially, look, there are three main determinant factors with, with um, the increase in house pricing. One is immigration, uh, the second is cheap money, and the third is the supply of land. I don't think we can do much about immigration. We can't stop New Zealanders returning home. We're allowed to return. I think we're going to see a lot more of that in the post-COVID environment, and that's a safe country. I don't think we can do much about that. Secondly, we can't do much about cheap money. Cheap money's going to be cheap for a long time just to the way that the economy is in the world are now running. But the third thing we can do a lot about is the increase of five housing. We can do that by reforming completely the, the Resource Management Act. Uh, one particular issue that's dear to my heart, which infuriates me like nothing else, just over the road here, the Stanley Street car park, we've been talking about developing that car park 
turning it into housing and commercial office development for more than 10 years. And all we get appears at, at local board level and all the council level is a gridlock and roadblock. Now, 10 years ago, those houses would have cost half the price to build than what they would cost when they're eventually built. And that's the main drive of housing prices. We have to stop it. We have to get on and do it. And by doing that, when we do it, by reforming the Resource Management Act, just getting on to it. She asked someone else to go back. Building all of their most points, which are some of them. I don't know if you can all see it. But... Building on from this, and, and sitting here listening to these other parties, what you about the housing prices? When each and every one of them have policies that are going to make it worse, it's driving me mad. National yesterday came out with a policy today, they're going to reduce tax for speculators. That will make profits go down. That will make it go down further. Anytime you increase the distortion in the tax system, you're just driving demand even more. Greens want to increase tax and same with labour different levels, increase tax on the highest income earners. That increases these levels. You again increase the distortion and you drive up house prices. Every single one of these parties have policies that will drive up house prices. And these standing here in front of you today telling you that they're going to fix it, they will not because they're ignoring this. Green housing. I was letting um, Natasha answer this question, but I would like to add that um, alternative styles of housing, such as co-housing and intentional communities, could be a good way to go. But at the moment, the legal uh, hurdles to get over are quite difficult. And um, but it is a grow growing area in New Zealand, and some communities um, uh, been very successful in delivering the role and we're still in. So, uh, hope more of that can happen. Okay. I'd like to start by saying that we are still renting. And I'm very pleased that the Labour led government has made sure that every New Zealander has a warm, dry, safe place to call home. Okay. Equally, I was very pleased when Barfoot and Thompson called out Judith Collins and the National Party for reversing what this government has already put in place. You don't need national government. Party won't labor. <laughs> uh, okay, Simon, you can respond on that. <laughs> Look, average rent price will shore around $750. Uh, average house price in Sunny Milk and Forest to $950,000. Taking home only $1.65 million. The reality is, in terms of affordability and repaying mortgage, we need to focus on growing our economy and growing our jobs and growing the amount of income that people can earn. And so the National Party have got very clear policies around growing the our technology sector, and that is a huge area of growth for our economy now and in the future. We've seen our dairy exports probably within five years. So that is the key element around that. Our elderly population are locked out in terms of the health house market. Um, the national policy around uh, rent to buy for social housing, I think, is a great policy and is a practical policy that would move us in terms of the right direction. Thank you. Uh, now we get education. Take a further community facilities trust. Is Sarah here? Yes. Sarah, there you are. Uh, can I go to a up? Um, I'm Sarah Thorne from Tatapuna North Community Trust. Um, I have a question that has been submitted by our youth group. This is something that's very close to their hearts. Um, what action will your party take to ensure that there are enough qualified teachers in our school to support our young people in gaining the skills and resilience to find work in what is a very uncertain future? And just to qualify that, um, some of these kids are being taught maths by science teachers because there are enough maths teachers and vice versa. So we just need to know about um, how you're going to deal with the teacher shortage. Thank you. I uh, will start with uh, North Code again. We'll go backwards this time. So, Shannon, you can start. This will be your last appearance. Mm. Thank you. Oh, thanks, education. thanks, everyone, for having me. Uh, my apologies, I have to he head off. Um, this is a very important subject uh, to myself, and, and I've had confirmation that under this government, the work that we've done, the first goal was to increase the number of teachers out into our local schools, and that's been achieved. 
What you're particularly talking about is about having uh, particular specialists and subject areas and funding a school to ensure that they are able to provide a diverse curriculum in the right way. We've got a very good example that I've worked uh, with in Birkenhead College recently, where albeit uh, they're struggling with a, a, a low role, uh, they're not able to offer te reo Māori as a part of their curriculum because they simply don't have qualified and capable teachers in that subject matter area. And I've been able to negotiate for the next 18 months funding to get that, that subject taught face-to-face -face, uh, and bring that teacher on board while they're able to work through the other challenges. But that is, that is the next um, goal for, for, for the next government is to work on that. And we know that Te Reo Māori teachers is up there too. We've got to train more uh, and ensure that, that our commitment to Te Reo within the curriculum is there. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Education. Thanks. I think um, hopefully it's going to be a cross party support that we uh, need to increase the number of teachers. We also need to retain teachers. And um, as I said, I went to the teacher's strike. Uh, of my good friends and teachers, and one way to retain teachers is by paying them on, and I think that's something that hopefully we can get cross pays in the book. So the new Conservative uh, policy on education is to give more power back to the parents and take it away, not take it completely away, but take it from the, music, uh, from the Department of Education and give it back to parents. So for instance, uh, we would take bulk funding and take their money and give it back to parents so that the money follows the child. That way, um, parents can decide which children, which school they send their children to on a term by term basis. And that fosters healthy competition between schools to be more efficient with the money that's coming in and to provide the curriculum that the parents want, um, not what the uh, Department of Education decides should be taught to our children. Okay, and then I'll add one. Yes, we've got to attract and retain uh, our teachers, and um, absolutely the way to do that is, I think, what Natasha said is correct. You've got to pay them more. And uh, I wish the national government had done more in the previous nine years on this issue, but we had a global financial crisis and there were constraints around that. Certainly, we are absolutely committed to seeing that improve, and certainly with my passion for the subject, I uh, want to see that improve even further. On the retention, I mean, I'm seeing a lot of teachers getting burned out, uh, principals getting burned out, the dealing with the ministry. So I think what we need to do is actually get the ministry working for teachers rather than teachers working for the ministry. Uh, and that's a lot of bureaucracy and trying to actually streamline that process. I do want to talk just about teacher aids because I think it's really important in our classrooms that um, uh, teachers have support people who can help with uh, particularly uh, our most high risk uh, individuals and Nationals announced $600 million to boost teacher aid in our classrooms to make sure that every kid gets the kind of support that they need for a bright and healthy future. Thank you. Good. Let's move then to North Shore and Simon, you're up first. Thanks. Look, the reality is our teachers are the backbone of our uh, communities and in a post-COVID world where the demand for skill sets and workforce to drive and rebuild our economy is going to be even more critical. In terms of specific policy interventions, National will remove the teacher registration uh, fee, which is actually planned to double uh, early next year. It's that is particularly going to be an immediate benefit back. We've also announced quite significant policies around infrastructure investment in terms of schools, and it's particularly around uh, bonus funding for uh, students uh, in the schools with disabilities and learning uh, issues. We've also said that we would put an additional $160 million into that space. And so as a father of two young boys, 8 and 10, you know, I'm uh, critically invested as much as anyone else here in terms of making sure that our education sector uh, is fit for purpose for the future. Thank you, Robbie. Do you have kids in school? Raise your hand if you have. Okay. Have you seen them selling chocolates just to fundraise for their school? Okay. They are not doing that because labor has funded the needs of the schools. Initially, with 400,000 fast track school upgrades, that's part of it. Going back to your question, and the answers provided by some of the gentlemen and ladies in here, we do need to pay them and pay them well. <laughs> but we need to put our money where our mouth is, and labor has done that. 
And we will continue to fund education because we believe that every child has the right to be educated regardless of his or her circumstances, regardless of his or her parents, and regardless of the aspiration that he or she has in the trades, in the arts, in sciences, whatever the kid wants to aspire for, we should be able to provide. Thank you. Fine. Okay, and we're up to Elizabeth. Thank you, Elizabeth. Well, education is something that's dear to my heart. I was senior editor at Takura, the correspondence school, for four years, and I saw close up 600 wonderful teachers who supported kids learning by distance. And of course, a lot more teachers have had to do that this year with COVID. The Green Party want pay parity across early childhood primary and secondary teachers based on qualifications and responsibility. Professional development and ongoing training opportunities should improve teacher performance rather than performance pay. We've improved child to teacher ratios. Our commitments under the Treaty of Waitangi require teacher training in Tikana and Tyrol Island. We will support schools to have resources and programs to create inclusive culture, free of bullying and racism. And health, nutrition and sustainability should be embedded across school curriculum to help tech students be more resilient. Thank you. And Shaya. So Top wants to reform our education system to move towards a high trust model where we prioritise teaching and learning over compliance and testing. And go back to learning being part of a process and not just an outcome. So part of our plan would be to dismantle ERO and use the savings in that bureaucracy to put that back into professional development for our teachers and support them in that way. The, the system at the moment isn't working for students and it's not working for teachers. So it doesn't make sense to keep doing something that isn't working. We need to move towards what education should be. Learning for life, love of learning for life, not freaking out for the next test. Thank you. And Nick, please. Okay, so the question was geared to how we can have more teachers to enable them to teach students about the, the, the more problematic world we're gonna have in the next 10 or 20, 30 years, which we are. Um, and, and I think that part of would say what we, the way we do that is, first thing we're gonna do, um, one of our goals is to take the $250,000 that each child has essentially allocated across his education life, leave it, to, leave it separately, put aside for that family, for that child, uh, for them to spend at whatever school, whatever institution that they believe is best for their child, because every child is different. And if we put children to school and make them learn history, geography, maths, but some children are very good at doing other stuff and they should be allowed to grow in that area. It doesn't really matter what it is. And the funding that follows a child and what the child is good at is the better way of teaching that child rather than teaching them stuff that's not necessarily what they're interested in or good at doing. The second thing we'll do is that we'd like to bring back our partnership schools, obviously, and we would encourage um, state schools to change into partnership schools if they wish to do so. Because again, it comes back to the choice model of partnership schools of children being able to learn um, what suits them rather than a one size fits all approach from them. Finally, Mike, on that point. Certainly, uh, the New Conservatives would endorse what Mitch just said as well uh, about having partnership schools. But um, one of the key uh, policy areas we'd like to see is the removal of gender ideology in schools. There's no place for it in schools. It's uh, parents versus state. Uh, and we would uh, advocate for the removal of that type of education in our school system and just get back to what we really need our children to be taught. And uh, secondly, the number of bureaucrats we have in Wellington, uh, I would advocate a one for one, swap one out and get a new teacher in. That would certainly help. Thank you. <laughs> yes, okay. Well, we're now on to a new topic. Only two topics to go, so we, I think you're all getting really well. Um, poverty. The first question is from North Shore Budget Service, and Lisa is here to read that one. Lisa cool. East. Sure, everyone. Lisa East, I'm the manager for North Shore Budget Service. So in our experience, we've had people tell us that they don't have enough income coming into the household to make ends meet. And it's growing over, well, I'm just going to add another caveat here, it's growing in that I've just completed a report for the last three months 
and we did twice as many mentoring sessions than what we were funded for. So that's how much it's grown in the last three months and through COVID. So Harold, will you address poverty on the North Shore? And then the question from the North Shore Women's Centre, is Tracy here? Um, I'm speaking with um, Tracy. Um, the question is, what actions would you take to decrease poverty for women and children? So if you think it's like what I was answering, Okay, big, big topic, uh, short answers. Starting with uh, the North Shore this time, we'll start with uh, Mike. Okay, I'll keep it short. Uh, look, our, our policy for helping uh, people on a, a lower income is simply uh, to have first 20,000 of income tax free. Uh, and as to helping families, uh, we have a, a policy for income, income splitting. Uh, so that the uh, tax is shared and uh, helps strengthen that family to keep them together and uh, help them out financially. Thank you. Thank you. And Nick, you're on next. So what that would do is straight away is cut GST rate from 15 to 10 to 10%, which would immediately uh, allow uh, every household and family more money uh, for a year. Second thing, we would reduce the um, 30% income tax rate down to 17.5% for that band of up to $70,000. And that's the large portion of working New Zealanders because that's tend to, tend to be where they most sit in terms of income. But the third thing that we need to do desperately, and we've touched on it before, is, a, is poverty, um, particularly on North Shore. North Shore is an expensive place to live, and let's not kid ourselves. Uh, and the fact that housing, which was usually the most expensive uh, single line item cost in any family, is so expensive, we have to address the housing issue on North Shore, both in terms of renting, and home ownership. And until we do that in renting, we must make it easier for landlords to own property, not make it more difficult and more expensive. And we have to reform the Resource Management Act, and we have to allow developments such as I talked about before and Taka Kuna to go ahead a lot more quickly than what they are, but delay in development is cost, and we have to keep that cost down. Good, and Shai, please. It, it really is housing. What I said at the start, the single biggest driver of poverty and rising inequality in New Zealand is the rising <coughs> cost of housing and TOPS plan will keep housing steady. To make sure that families have more cash in their hand each week, TOPS Universal Basic Income provides $250 a week to every adult, no conditions, no questions asked. So that means the first $250 of anyone's current benefit is unconditional. That first $250 cannot be abated away. Because as I mentioned earlier, the welfare trap in our current system at the moment is hugely punitive. The UBI, the, the biggest wonders of the UBI are our working poor. Those who are having to work multiple jobs and they deal with secondary tax rates for having to work harder is just madness. And instead, it's there no matter how many hours of work you work in a week, you get to keep it. We really need to be ensuring that all families have enough money, but this is not something that we should be putting on businesses. So our focus is on a real win-win, making sure everyone has enough. I could talk about that for a long time. <laughs> Top one of the money then. Elizabeth. Um, I'm leaving the test around to this. Okay. Uh, Romy, you're back on. Sad, isn't it? Poverty has many faces, and we are given one minute to address all the faces. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'll take it from the point of view of uh, <clears throat> dignifying work. If we pay our workers the wages that they need to survive, I'm going to put that word out there, living wage, then that's going to help a lot our situation in poverty. Thank you. Good. And Simon. Yeah, thanks, Lisa. But I expect that women or women have been disproportionately impacted by the impacts of COVID. Uh, mm -hmm. and those are the ones that proportionately lost their jobs as a result of some of the lockdowns. So they're probably the ones I would expect to be coming in for an entry across because often they're the ones who are managing the impact of the budget. National's policy around that is tax cuts focused around middle income earners, $65,000 uh, net income per annum, $3,000 mm -hmm. in terms of back pocket. Fastest way that we can get support to be like that from the 1st of December, $45 a week into that back pocket to provide the support that we've been talking about here. That's correct. Mm -hmm. The other aspect as well um, is around the uh, support around job start for businesses to be able to create and hire people. Because the best way to deal with poverty is to put people into paid employment to get that uh, root of that intergenerational aspect, which is one of the key issues around poverty. We've got to break that cycle and the funding to try and create 
have more jobs in our economy, we'll get uh, a number of those people back into work. Thank you. Um, let's turn to Northcote. Dan, you're on first. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Lisa, and for all that you do at the Northcote Budget and the Service. Uh, your team does a fantastic job. So, look, to reduce poverty, we've got to either increase incomes or decrease costs for families. And so my <coughs> colleague here, Simon Watts, has talked about our tax cuts. I think that's a fantastic way of giving immediate relief for those who have been disaffected or affected from COVID-19. The other thing is around uh, skills and education. And my example, my story is a great example of that. I was a qualified butcher. I retrained. I got a job as an economist. I retrained again, uh, went into the business world. And that's, I think, the story of success for New Zealanders going forward. And that's why we've announced our IT policy. Now, you know, if you have a woman who's been laid off, you can retrain. Uh, there's high paying jobs in the IT sector, Smells Farm, Kuana Street down in North Coast, they are screaming out for talent and high paying jobs, right? So that is a fantastic opportunity. On the cost side, we've already said that we've repealed the regional fuel tax, which is a very small cost, uh, but nonetheless very important. And I think on the housing costs, we've repealed the uh, Residential Tenancies Act changes, which, which, which in fact increases rents. Uh, through the skyrocketing costs that we've seen. So that's it from me. <laughs> Thank you. Dan, and not even red meat, you've moved a long way from butchery. <laughs> <laughs> your, your old colleagues won't be very happy about it. <laughs> Come on, Bill, you're on. Thank you for your question, Lisa. Um, very quickly, in one minute, um, how do we in poverty? One, no more COVID lockdowns. This is quite controversial, but New Conservative backs a policy of no more COVID lockdowns. Instead, we protect our elderly, we protect them, we isolate them, protect them from the disease. We can't stop the disease through community spread by having ongoing lockdowns every time there's an outbreak. All we're going to do is destroy our businesses. The disease is not that, not that deadly anyway, okay? Number two. <laughs> it's factual. It's, it's factual and it's dangerous only to elderly people, not to Asian people, right? So let's not destroy business. That just to get in the way of the story. Okay, but anyway, moving on. Next one, we talked about housing. Demand is here, supply is here. We've got to bring it back down until it's three times the average wage. And number three, we want to build strong families so that in poverty, at least your family is supporting you. The family is the first place to go, not a government department like, like I run at um, Families, not social services, to support the young people. Like Dan's a success story. If you've got a good family that can push you through with the hard times of your, your youth, you can come out the top. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, finally, this one is Natasha. I'm going to have my phone here because I don't want to miss out any important points because I think the Green Party poverty action plans are really. Um, really, really help a lot of people in New Zealand and more people who are going to lose their jobs due to COVID. Um, they want to guarantee minimum income of 325 per week for students and people out of work, no matter what. I want to say as a student, I know people from huge developing families, um, probably development families that had their money in trust and that they, the kids, um, qualified for student allowance, whereas their peers didn't, just because of the way people hide money. So 325 a week for students, no matter what. Um, not relying on their parents having to pay for them, and also those parents are struggling themselves. A universal child benefit for uh, each child under three of $100 per week. A simplified family support credit of $190 per week for the first child and $120 per week for subsequent children, replacing working for families tax credits. An additional support for single parents through a $110 a week top up. Um, they also, uh, the Greens want to change um, abatement and relationship rules so people can earn more from paid work and before their income entitlements are reduced. There's a lot of um, issues with people with black jobs. Oh, thank you. And yes, yes, the Green Party of Bobby. Thank you. So the final set of questions around the theme of diversity. And the first one is from Yes Disability Sonia here. Oh, oh okay. Would you, would you like to read out the question? Uh, uh, and our question is, um, as North Shore has uh, no trains and only a few buses that have um, accessibility features, uh, what can North Party do to expand um, on the access to public transport for disabled people? Sure. And the second question is from the English language partners. Is Andrew here? Yes, Andrew, could you read that, please? Uh, 
I got to my injector from English language partners. So uh, we have a significant really stable population here on the shore. So my question was, uh, what do you see as their needs as presentations? <laughs> okay, well, um, we're back to the bottom of the alphabet again. We'll start with the North Shore. Simon, would you like to get this one running? Yep, no worries. Hey, Josh. Uh, so basically, uh, we would National Party have talked about advocating for increasing our theories uh, in terms of increasing the frequency uh, and the number of theories. We want to be pushing hard against uh, getting the standard Bay theory reopened. We've launched a petition today in terms of getting uh, pressure on council because we need more theories and not less. Uh, in terms of um, the uh, longer term plan, obviously the second half of crossing would include rail tunnel. The busway is already set up for to take light rail. Uh, and in terms of a long term uh, plan, in terms of decade, uh, that is the uh, future question of that. Uh, in terms of the other question, um, really, I think around you know, getting people uh, interested in getting uh, more uh, immigrants in terms of into employment uh, around that, uh, trying to get population 12.5% of this electorate. Uh, and ensuring that we've got a mechanism in terms of jobs uh, for people to go into. Uh, this is a key way to support that development in our community. Robbie. <coughs> oh, we're doing a lot of work with communities through Foundation North already. And with the work that uh, we do, uh, I, I used to do with the Long Out in the Road, like the Long Migrant Services in terms of the migrant communities as well. I just would like to highlight that the diversity that we have is something that we should try to encourage and deliver. Um, just, I think, yesterday or that day ago, I read this article about using the 90-day trial period for businesses to be able to assess the ethnicity of the, the capability of, of people coming from the ethnic communities. And this is, a, this is a policy that came out from the National Party. And I don't believe that is a policy that is good for diversity. Migrants like me, you look at me and say, I'll give you a 90-day trial, I'll test you out. That's a lot of nonsense. If you believe in diversity, look beyond the color of people. Thank you. Okay, this is what you uh, Yes, I'd like to answer the second question. Um, for those who speak little or no English, migrants need a myriad of official information to be available in their own languages, which here might include Samoan, Korean, Mandarin, Japanese for our new arrivals on the shore. And we need more support for teachers who have children learning English as a second language. But even those who speak English may have many questions about life in New Zealand. How do we do banking? Where should, when should we take our children to doctors for checkups? And where are the shops to buy our traditional foods? The Green Party will improve resourcing for community providers to enable successful outcomes for refugee and migrant communities. On a personal, personal note, my future daughter-in-law, who is from southern China, voted in her first ever election on Sunday. She is 31 and has no experience of democracy. This is a sort of cultural divide that some of our new populations have to navigate. And uh, we enjoy celebrating traditional festivals from both China and Aotearoa. I'll also start with the second question as well. Sadly, the growing problem that we're seeing for New Zealanders is they're disproportionately getting um, basically abused by employers who are not respecting immigration or employment law. And so part of TOP's policies is really um, increasing investigations into that and punishing employers who are taking advantage of New Zealanders because sadly it's actually something that's been growing. Um, so that's something that we've built into our policy there. Uh, as far as the second, the first question, sorry, goes, uh, it's a great question. Clearly more investment is needed in public transport right across the board as part of moving to a low emissions uh, future. But we need to ensure that it's accessible and that's part of being built into the new public transport that's going to be happening. So accessibility for everyone is essential for a well-connected, well-functioning society. Everyone needs to feel that they have a place. Part of TOPS building out that all policy is changing the way we design our cities as well, so that people don't have to travel as far as they can currently and can get to where they need to. Much easier, simpler. Thank you. And uh, Nick, please. 
In terms of the first question, um, I, th I think it's more of a regional question than a central government question. And perhaps, you know, one thought that came to me was whether um, the transport, when they're negotiating their contracts with the bus providers, to actually require in their contract um, some sort of disability part of the bus. Um, and I think Simon's right in that if the train end up coming in the train uh, under the new uh, Harbour Crossing, um, that's one thing. But of course, disabled people still have to get to the train station uh, and it'll run on the busway and they'll have to get there, so probably through a bus. So I think uh, from the contract level, perhaps the open transport can require it from bus providers. Uh, and the second one question I asked about, uh, we were asked about um, new settlers. I've had experience now, I've been helping our families in Eritrea for five or six years, settled in North Coast, now I'm actually in, in Beach Haven. Uh, and their needs are simply housing, employment, and English language, pretty much, and, and the, the corresponding stuff that goes along with settlement. Um, that was that was earlier touched on. So they're the three needs. Um, you know, it all comes back to a lot of these questions we've asked and, and been asked before to do with housing and employment, and that's where strong economy and building more houses and reform and resource management that comes as well. Thank you. And Mark. Uh, on the first question, I actually agree with uh, Nathan about it's a council issue, and I think definitely putting pressure on that. Uh, and I think his suggestion about when they go out to tender, making that part of the tender is simple, it could easily solve a bit of that, um, those issues. On the second question, I think um, I endorse you for any ass assistance with English language because obviously that's the biggest barrier when immigrants come to New Zealand. And uh, I think another one is actually validating uh, what qualifications they have that they bring to this country because we end up with guys that have got science degrees driving taxis uh, or uh, in the orthodontic realm, you've got a closed shop and they can't get into the, and that's a big issue in New Zealand is there's a lot of closed shops where it's very difficult for them to be recognised here in New Zealand. And I think that's where government can step in and help make that uh, more accessible for them. Uh, and uh, lastly, just want to comment, um, the three month trial is not about race, it's about competency. I've been an employer and I've also been an employee, and if you've got the confidence and you're going to do a good job, I have no problem going into a three month trial for a job. And as an employer, it's the same way. You should have the ability to uh, let go of someone that's not confident after three months. Thank you. Good. Switching now to North Coast, Natasha, you're up first. Thanks. Um. So the Green Party policy is that all uh, buses should be uh, accessible to people with disabilities, and that should just, it should just already be exist, and it's shocking that it doesn't. Um, we also obviously want to expand the busing network to change into electric buses and, um, oh sorry, trains, and all the trains as well would be accessible. Um, regarding the second question, um, I think, what really is a, the most appropriate um, response to this is to actually ask the community groups what are their issues and actually have that communication and dialogue because who are we as politicians? I'm not a uh, new migrant to New Zealand. Why should I be dictating what their issues are and where funding should go? We should be talking to community groups and funding those community groups as the way of helping them. Good. Uh, Bill, you're up next. Sure. Um, first off, in, in terms of transport um, and accessibility to disabled people, uh, we back the ATAC plan to put a light rail network on the North Shore. Um, I think it's great for a, a city, particularly like uh, Auckland, that's becoming more and more densely populated. I've been in Singapore, love the uh, rapid transit rail system there, very accessible to disabled people. The platform is the same level as a train, you don't have to have a bus that kneels down and gets up again. So that's that. Uh, the other side, of it, the integration for our um, new people coming into New Zealand, particularly the Chinese community. I know through um, my, my time with Dolphins Basketball Club, maybe a third of them are Chinese people who come in and we really interact with one another like that. So the local sports and local community groups like that that everyone can be a part of is a great way to welcome um, new immigrants. Thank you. And Dan, you get the final word on the final <laughs> question. <laughs> <laughs> Good well, uh, thank you very much, Josh. And as a final speaker, look, I agree with a lot of what's been said around uh, improving bus accessibility, uh, the investment in our ferry network, which uh, National's committed to, the second harbour crossing, which will be rail, no matter who's in government. It might be a timeline issue on Labor's side, but um, we need to get rail to the shore. That's a real key priority. On the second uh, point around 
uh, migrant challenges. Absolutely agree with what's being said around language, community, jobs. Um, I do want to say one other thing that's been missed is around the uh, issues with family, family reunification. And I've had a lot of complaints and issues of uh, new migrants wanting to bring their family here either for a vacation or, or uh, permanently. And they've been hamstrung by the bureaucracy of Immigration New Zealand. So our policy is very clear. We've got to get that bureaucracy out of Immigration New Zealand. The processing times have, have just gone way up in the last few years. So we're going to have a lot more tighter management of that if we get into government. Thank you. Thank you. I have stood in public office. Um, these are brave people. They put their life on the line, they put their intellect on the line, and standing for parliament is at the top of the tree. So we are all extremely happy that you people have done this on our behalf. Um, we wish you all the very best in your pursuits, both personal votes and party votes. And I think everyone here will be really happy to say thank you all so much and do a big round of applause. Thank you.